In this video we'll take a look at the geographical conditions, the balance of force and approaches of the Japanese, United States and her allies for the war in the Pacific. One of the most obvious differences to the war in Europe is the overall dimension of the areas involved. Just the distance from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor is about 3700 kilometers. This is more than two times the distance from Berlin to Moscow with 1600 kilometers. Note that since the Earth is more or less a sphere, the distances here are not displayed precisely. The difference in distance is also underlined by the difference in quality. After all, one is the distance from one capital to another, whereas the other far longer distance is just from one friendly naval base to another. The geographical aspects of the region had strong influence on all operations. Most islands in the Pacific had lagoons that provided natural harbors and thus were ideal for operational and logistical purposes. Some regions were affected by typhoons, but overall the weather suited for aerial and naval activities, whereas most islands and land masses were relatively unsuited or even hostile for ground forces due to the hot, wet climate and vegetation. This is also reflected by the high amount of losses due to diseases. Due to these geographical properties, there was always a strong interdependency between naval, air and ground combat. For any fleet operation, the long ranges were highly dependent on logistics and maintenance. Furthermore, the vast space required major recon operations to keep surprises to a minimum. One of the major elements in this were flying boats with their long ranges. For instance, the H-8K1 with up to 7200 km in range. Aircraft, either land or sea-based, were specially suited for attack and support operations. For instance, the Imperial Japanese Navy possessed a strong land-based naval bomber force, the Riku units, which were developed to counter the limits on the number of carriers due to naval treaties. Ground operations were limited in many ways due to climate, the resulting diseases, logistics and the terrain and vegetation. As a result, usually only key positions in coastal areas were taken and secured, which required steady supply lines provided by air and naval operations. This is also reflected by the rather small numbers of ground forces in the Pacific campaign, especially in comparison with the European theater of operations. Hence, long front lines were rare, furthermore the amount of motorized and mechanized warfare was limited. A strong emphasis on medical services was necessary due to the relatively high amount of diseases in comparison to Europe. Now let's take a look at the balance of force in the Pacific in 1931. Be aware that I looked at several publications, although in general numbers are similar, there are some differences, which are probably the result of different counting techniques. For instance, the US Pacific Fleet had 9 battleships at the outbreak of the war, but 2 were overhauled and one of them in a dry dock, and some authors go with 9 and others with 8 battleships. Anyway. The Japanese had a total of 10 battleships, the US Pacific and Asian fleets had 8, the British Empire and Commonwealth forces 2, and the Netherlands 0. In terms of carriers, the Japanese had 10, the US 3, and the Honor Island forces none. The number of cruisers on the Japanese side were 38, the US 24, the British 17, and the Netherlands 3. For destroyers, the Japanese had 113, the US 80, the British a mere 6 and the Dutch 7. In terms of submarines, the Japanese had 65, the US 56, the British none and the Dutch 15. Now note that the Dutch units were quite old and in general were also dependent on the British and US for supplies and maintenance due to the occupation of the Netherlands back in Europe. Now if we sum up the Allied ships, we get the following situation, which appears quite balanced with the sole exception of the aircraft carriers where the Japanese had a clear numerical advantage. Now already in spring 1940, the US Congress approved the expansion of the US Navy by a large amount to create the two ocean navy that could deal with any opponent in both the Atlantic and Pacific. In December 1941, the following ships were in construction or scheduled for construction. 15 battleships, 11 carriers, 54 cruisers, 191 destroyers and 73 submarines. Well, so much for the balance. Although it is important to note that the completion of this program would need several years and also that some of these units were cancelled, like the Montana class battleships. Now some additional information related to these numbers. The Imperial Japanese Navy had experienced and highly trained pilots for their carrier planes. The A6M0 was the best carrier-borne fighter plane at the outbreak of the war. Additionally, the Japanese had an experienced land-based naval bomber force especially trained for naval operations. 
Japanese cruisers were usually equipped with larger caliber guns than their Allied counterparts to make up for the numerical disparity, whereas the Japanese destroyers had a strong secondary armament with high caliber long range torpedoes. Although their numbers of 113 was larger than the combined Allied force, it was not sufficient to support both major fleet operations and protecting the transport fleet. Whereas other navies had usually smaller specialized escort ships, these were mostly lacking in the Imperial Japanese Navy. Although the Japanese anti-submarine warfare capabilities were limited, their submarines were modern and large, with high speed in order to keep up with enemy battle fleets. The US Navy was a well-balanced force and was in a state of modernization and expansion after the US Congress basically approved the construction of the Two Ocean Navy in 1940. The Dutch, British and Commonwealth forces were due to their German successes in Europe limited in quality, quantity and support. But let's also take a short look at the situation of the ground forces. At the outbreak of the war in the Pacific in 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army had about 2 million men, with 51 operational divisions, 21 independent brigades and 37 modern units in brigade strength, of various kinds like anti-aircraft and artillery and engineers. Additionally, there were about 10 to 15,000 soldiers of the Special Naval Landing Force operational that were the Japanese Marine units and part of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Yet a vast amount of the army units were stationed in China and Manchuria. Thus for the attack in the South Pacific, the Southern Army was organized consisting of 11 infantry divisions, 4 brigade side units and 700 aircraft. The Japanese soldier was renowned for his tenacity and unwillingness to surrender. Yet the rapid expansion of the Japanese Army from 1937 to 1941 had in overall decreased the quality of the troops, especially the officers. Additionally, the war in China that started in 1937 had taken its toll on the Japanese troops and equipment. The Allied ground forces consisted of the US Marine Corps, US Army, British and Dutch forces. At the outbreak of the war, the US Marine Corps had about 65,000 men. Of those 25,000 men were organized in two divisions, with their own planes and amphibious vehicles. The US Army at the outbreak of the war was still in a major buildup and thus had just a few operational units stationed in the Philippines, which were used together with local units. In the United States, around 30 US Army divisions were mobilized but still poorly equipped and trained. The British and Dutch troops in the Pacific were limited in capabilities due to the war in Europe. The British forces were scattered and mostly colonial troops of limited quality. Only Singapore had been built up, but mainly against an attack from the sea. The Dutch had about 38,000 men, but due to the large area and scatter of their possessions, even a bigger force would have been unable to provide a suitable defense. Let's take a short look how the different forces approached the warfare in the Pacific. Although the Japanese started the war by attacking Pearl Harbor, the basic concept of fighting the United States was mostly a defensive one. The idea was similar to the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Namely, that the enemy would move into areas that are within the Japanese operational area and then fight a decisive battle in which the majority of the enemy forces should be destroyed. The Japanese military leadership was aware that they had no chance to achieve victory against the United States. The goal was to acquire enough resources in Asia and Southeast Asia to achieve autarky for its industry and then defend this area against the US and British in a war of attrition until the enemy's will to fight would be broken and a peace could be negotiated that would confirm the Japanese hegemony in the area. Yet there were many major flaws with this approach, which is the reason why some people don't call it a strategy because it was more like a simple plan. Probably one of the greatest flaws in military and economic respects was the neglect of non-combat vessels on several levels. Even despite the major importance of logistics for any operation in the vast areas of the Pacific and Japan's own vulnerability from imports, this neglect led to major losses of their own non-combat units and they also ignored many opportunities to strike against allied shipping capabilities. This was in clear contrast to the US that had a strong emphasis on the interaction between logistics and operational aspects. To go directly from a publication of the Division of Naval Intelligence about the identification of ships. In waters where adequate docking, repair and fuel facilities do not exist, the crippling of an enemy repair ship or oiler may require modification or abandonment of an important operation. The destruction of an enemy's auxiliaries must therefore be regarded as an objective of major importance. Another major difference between the Japanese and the Allies was the approach towards the members of their respective alliance. Whereas the British and US coordinated their efforts, the Japanese didn't inform Germany nor Italy about their goals, schedule and forces. Which brings us to the Allied approach, 
Already in spring 1941, long before the United States entered the war, the US and British leadership agreed upon the so-called Germany First strategy and that the control of the Atlantic was crucial in winning the war in Europe. Thus only a limited amount of forces was available in the Pacific and the British and US staff officer concluded that in the Pacific the defense had to be performed mostly by naval forces until more forces were available. To do the large area of operations, the Allied forces should defend vital areas that would serve as a base for a counter-offensive like Singapore, Manila and Hawaii. Now there's one final aspect of the war in the Pacific that needs to be addressed, namely the strategic weaknesses of the Japanese. The two major strategic weaknesses of Japan were its limited industrial capacity and its dependency on imports. The industrial capacity was approximately 10% of the United States according to a post-war US assessment. Yet this limited industrial capacity was highly dependent from imports and for a large part those originally came from the United States, which in 1938-39 provided about 75% of scrap metal, 50% of copper, 80% of oil and 60% of machines tools needed by the Japanese industry. After all, the Japanese aggression against the United States was influenced by the US cancellation of its trade agreements. Although the Japanese began stockpiling resources prior to the war, the leadership clearly underestimated the duration of the upcoming conflict. To summarize, the difference between the war in the Pacific and Europe are quite staggering. The Germans always spoke about the vastness of the Eastern Front, but compared to the vastness of the Pacific, the dimension just pale in comparison. At the same time, the number of divisions assigned for major offensive operations in 1941 against the Allies was 11 Japanese divisions whereas the Germans deployed a staggering amount of 150 divisions against the Soviet Union in summer 1941. The strategic difference in the Pacific between the Japanese and US was severe, although an initial view at the balance of force might give a different impression. Due to the strong industrial and resource base of the United States, the initial situation could and was changed within a few years. On the operational level, the Japanese had clearly an advantage. By being at war already for four years, thus having better trained, and experienced troops, which allowed them to achieve several of their early victories. But at the same time they had already sustained quite some losses to their land forces and equipment. The main weakness of the Japanese was their lack in industrial capacity and dependency on imports. These were not of their own making, but their unwillingness to protect their merchant fleet and also to create a unified command of army and navy in order to focus the limited resources was a grave error on their part. The fact that the Allies were closely cooperating and fighting a global war together, whereas the Axis members lacked even a proper communication, let alone cooperation strategy, didn't help the matter neither. Thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, check out the links, the other videos, and see you next time.